Nelson. I grew up in Northern California, mostly Weaverville, and uh, loved flying and so forth. Uh, this is the only part of the uniform that still fits. <laughs> I retired uh, in 2000 from, uh, I guess it's the largest airline in the world now. Um, my airline and U.S. Air joined. Uh, the last uh, nine years I was an instructor. The last seven I was the lead instructor at the uh, Flight Academy, largest flight academy in the world uh, outside of the military. So my part of this, when I was first introduced this, I just thought, no way, I don't believe in that, that's impossible. But it did start me looking up. And I started noticing that uh, what was happening in the air was not a natural phenomenon of uh, jet exhaust. Um, you can see some normal jet exhaust, you can still see those. In fact, the, the pictures up here show some, you see little, little short ones go by, and then you see these huge, big, long ones. Those long ones are not a natural phenomenon of that jet engine. Basically, it's a hydrocarbon fuel. It comes out the back. It's really hot, and it's got some, uh, some elements in there. It's uh, CO2, uh, a little bit of uh, uh, vapor and, uh, and soot, and it's extremely up there in high altitudes, uh, minus 40 degrees, and it comes out the back of the engine, and uh, that moisture uh, turns to ice, ice crystals, and you'll see that white line behind the, the aircraft, and it dissipates relatively short. Uh, because that ice sublimates back into gas, which becomes air, and it goes away. But when you see these lines that go from horizon to horizon, and they stay all day long and spreading, that's not natural. So I don't know where it's coming from. I don't know who's doing it. All I know is what happens with a jet engine in high altitude, and that's what I can testify to. I want to thank everyone for being here tonight, because the, these issues are, are incredibly important to all of us. Um, I was a weather observer in the uh, U.S. Air Force, and not too long ago, a person handed me a video, and it was called Chemtrails Over Marin. Well, I had no idea what a chemtrail was. I didn't know where Marin was because I was going in and out of uh, Marin County a lot in those days. Marin, Sonoma Lake, Napa, I worked in the North Bay a long time. Um, and when I looked at the video, well, they said, because you were a weatherman, can you give me some advice on what you think this aircraft, these aircraft trails are? Well, it didn't take me very long into there to go, my God, I have not been paying attention. Like so many people, I have not been paying attention. It's obvious, they're spraying, but what are they spraying? And, and how high are they flying, and what is it? You know, I found out it was about 35, 40,000 feet. I took flights across the country, went to New York, uh, went to Chicago. But anyway, I'm seeing this layer at 35 and 40,000 feet and going, how is that possible? In order for a particulate to stay in the sky that long, it has to be nano size. It, it has to be really small. I realized that it was a weather modification program and the biologist in me went, wait a minute. If you start modifying the weather, you're changing your precipitation areas, you're, you're changing the times, you're gonna be affecting every species that now is using that water. And if you take the water from one place, somebody else isn't gonna get it, okay? So what we're ending up seeing now is we've got floods right next to drought. It's a serious situation. You can change your, your ground microbes, you can change the plants, the timing of the plants and the animals, uh, you can change the whole thing. And I started looking at all the dead trees. I, I thought maybe it was just sun and high UV. Well, that was part of it. But also, um, the test started coming back where we've got literally tons of aluminum. Uh, the aluminum that we were finding, I started testing lichens because they only get their stuff from the air. And the lichens, basically, uh, the test in Calistoga came out uh, 40,000 micrograms per milliliter, which is huge. There should be zero. Uh, and the same thing happened for, for Middletown. Thank you for inviting me to be here. My name is Dr. Steve Davis. I'm a practicing chiropractor and a traditional naturopath, and I've been at this for over 40 years. We have an epidemic of DNA damage. 
Every time you go to a doctor with a complexing myriad of symptoms and they run a battery of tests and they tell you they don't know what's wrong with you, it fits into a category of your DNA has been damaged somehow and you may never get well. I have been on this quest for over 40 years. I left conventional medicine. I was a physician assistant in the United States Army during the tail end of Vietnam. And when I saw the drama that was going on in Vietnam, and I saw the issues that were happening with our health care, I left conventional medicine, went looking for natural medicine to cure those that were in these terrible states. In the DNA damage, you can look up on any Google site and you'll see radiation, chemicals, minerals, toxic elements, or the cause. We live in a sea of ongoing toxic soup and we all are affected. It is a frog experiment gone bad. Dane just shared what would happen if geoengineering continues to go and if we continue to have radiation from Fukushima, if we continue to immunize everybody for every scourge, if we continue to modify our food, GMO, if we continue to take conventional and non-conventional medications, it may come quicker. Good evening, everyone. My name is Bill Chappelle. I am a Shasta County uh, Board a Supervisor. I'm probably... <laughs> Thank you. I guess I'm unfairly minority here this, tonight, and uh, I'm not an expert. I don't know really a lot about this geoengineering. Um, I, I came here for support. I do believe we have something wrong, okay? Something's going on. A few months ago, we did write a letter, uh, and, I, and it was at the request of uh, Dane Wigington and, and part of his committee, uh, whatever he wants to call it, that came up to our board meeting. We addressed the letter to Ted Gaines, uh, Brian Dolly, Barbara Boxer, Diane Feinstein, Doug LaMoffa, uh, John uh, Belishki, uh, Matthew Rodriguez, Gina McCarthy, and Mary Nichols. And, um, basically said that on July 15th, the Shasta Board of Supervisors heard a testimony from citizens regarding geoengineering chemtrails. Enclosed is a copy of a DVD of the meeting. That was uh, Dane's DVD. For your information, our office is requesting a timely response to the concerns that were uh, voiced by the individuals that provided the input. If you've got any questions, please contact me. Larry Lees, uh, and this was actually signed by Les Baum. We haven't got any response from this yet, and uh, quite frankly, I don't think we will. Um, we've talked about the EPA, we've talked about the California uh, EPA. Um, they're so they're not very honest these days, okay? And I, and I could say. <laughs> They're somewhat corrupt. I did get some uh, email in my office that they thought I was a Looney Tune for coming here, you know, and they won't vote for me again or whatever. So that kind of happened. But I did get a letter the other day, which was oddly enough, was the day uh, October the 9th, and it was we received it in our board office um, October the 20th. And uh, this is basically addressed to the supervisors. It says, Dear Supervisors, Pacific Gas and Electric Company, located at 77 Beale Street, San Francisco, California, 94105, will continue a weather resources management project, cloud seeding, during the 2014-2015 winter in the Lake Amador, Butte Valley Reservoir, uh, Mountain Meadows Reservoir watersheds. Cloud seeding is the objective of increasing useful participation that will resume after November the 1st, 2014. PG&E staff will monitor the weather conditions forecast and lake levels and make the decisions uh, to seed accordingly. That's proof. I mean, that's, there's nothing there that's, uh, that you can say is contradictory or, or it's not there. You know, one, one of the problems that occurs when you try to get something done, a lot of people will come to me and they'll say, can't you do this, can't you do that? No, I can't. I really can't. Very limited on our power. It's, it's uh, kind of a frustrating experience. When I ran, I said, we together can make a difference. And that's actually what I meant. And what happens is that nobody 
wants to project a bad image, one, for a politician that's voting, how many people are going to lose or not. If I said tonight you guys are all nuts, none of you would vote for me, right? So, I mean, that, that would be, or if I said I'm a, a Chevy Avid fan, the Ford people wouldn't vote for me. So people that are politicians, they walk this fine line, and they really got to get off of it. I mean, they really do. They've got to get more to where they're actually working for the people. And another thing that happens is money. We take our money, our tax dollars that we work hard for, we give it to the government. The government turns around, and instead of helping us in their ways, they hinder us, and they put these programs out that we don't like. What happens is that if we do push back, they cut our funding back. They say, nope, you know, uh, you may not get this funding, you may not get this, you may not get the federal funding for a project. So they're, they're using our own resources against us. I'd first like to acknowledge all the young people who've come this evening. It's something that we haven't seen before. Thank you so much. My name is Mark McCandlish, and I worked for 30 years in the aerospace and defense industry as an illustrator, conceptual artist, and a designer. Uh, a lot of the projects that I worked on required that I had to be able to cross different fields of endeavor from material science to engineering to physics. So naturally, when these things started happening in the sky, and many of the defense contractors and aerospace companies that I work for design and build aircraft like Boeing, McDonnell Douglas, Rockwell, I began to become curious about what was going on. I was skeptical at first. I honestly didn't believe there was anything to the idea of chemtrails. Then around 2001, there was a headline in the newspaper. Now, this headline came two days after a sequence of heavy spraying over the Reading area. And I noticed the trails were persisting for most of the day. And that headline said, area hospitals report dozens of patients claiming respiratory distress. And that's when I began to suspect that there was something going on. So I began using the internet like probably many of you have, and I began looking for what the materials were that were being used and why. Now, there's an awful lot of technical material behind what you're seeing. For one thing, these particles, these nanoparticles that are being put into the air, not only help to shield the ground from the sun and block and reflect the sunlight, which can change the temperature of the air mass below that, make it cooler, make it come together and compress, but it can also be bombarded with microwave radiation from the ground. And if you match the frequency of these particles in just the right way, these particles will begin to heat up in the air and that heat is transferred to the surrounding air mass. Now, it only has to be a mild amount of heat. It could be 135 degrees. But if you have countless trillions of these particles suspended in the air that are all being painted with this signal, they will all heat up at the same time. And they will carry that air mass and all the moisture that's in it to a higher altitude where it will condense and become a powerful low pressure system. Now, people question whether it's possible to manipulate the weather, to steer the jet stream. You have to remember that when you put a coating over a surface and it cools down the air mass below that, the air comes together, it condenses. When you heat up the air mass, it rises and expands. And so by controlling where and when these events occur, you can actually control the flow of the jet stream. A few years ago, it was discovered that the amount of snow that fell in the Himalayas near Mount Everest would actually control where the jet stream went over the course of the following year. And that's just one location on the planet. But if you have thousands upon thousands of planes spraying this material in different regions around the world all at the same time, you can just imagine the amount of chaos that this will throw into the weather system for the entire planet. Now, the other side of this, of course, is the toxicology, the toxic effects that these materials have. Now, if this ball right here was a red blood cell, something you can't even see without a microscope, you could line 50 of these particles up next to a single red blood cell. That's how tiny they are.
they can be absorbed right through the skin. And of course, there's almost no filtration system that you can wear that will prevent these things from being introduced into your body during respiration. It was an Air Force study, the United States Air Force study that was conducted between 1993 and 2001. It was called In Vitro Toxicity of Aluminum Nanoparticles in Rat Alveolar Macrophages. Sounds real technical, but all it says is aluminum nanoparticles have a toxic effect on the white blood cells, the part of your immune system that exists right in your lungs, in the alveoli, the little air sacs that expand and contract when you breathe. Okay, this is your first line of defense against infection. So if you are able to suppress the activity of the immune system in the lungs, it means that anything else you put into the air, it'll go right into your system without your being able to defend against it. This is why it is so serious, not just at a toxic level, but as an epidemiological situation in terms of infection. And with this scare that we're having now about Ebola, you can just imagine, you can just imagine what might happen if the wrong material gets sprayed in the air. Greetings, I am Francis Wayne Mangels. I live in Mount Shasta. Qualifications first and then a little bit. Um, Bachelor of Science with Honors, International School of Forestry at Missoula. Master of Science Zoology, Montana State University. Psy Sigma Pi Scholarship in Community Service. California Community Colleges credential. How about that? Mensa International. And the next step that's a magnitude above that, Intertel. God dang. Yeah, I'm 10 times as good as a Mensa. How about that? But the thing I want to tell you about is I'd like you to, you know, I've got data about biology. I've got some observations here about stuff we've actually seen and have proven. There's another website out there by John White where I debunked the debunkers, the people who told me it was BS, but there's, there's about 90 points on here that the debunkers haven't been able to touch for about six or seven years. So I think this data here is gonna stand. And you're free to ask me anything in the realm of uh, biology, natural sciences, range, wildlife, and some of the stuff I'm seeing is pretty disheartening. Now, I'd like to get on to some of the people that got questions here now, so I'm cutting this a little bit short, but I hope you got good questions because by golly, we sure have answers up here. I had a conversation with a geoengineer over in the United Kingdom, and he told me um, when I began to discuss chemtrails, he said, I'm a scientist, that's bunk, and the only way you're going to show that to me was one of two ways. He said, you're going to either capture the cloud and break it down to its elements, or he said, you can use what's called spectrum analysis. And basically, there are units that you can stand on the ground, and they can, um, I guess it's a laser device, they can see into it, and they use this to, to see atmospheres and other planets. And basically, you can see what those elements are of the chemtrail. My question is, as scientists, how does that sound? Yes, it's possible to do a spectrum analysis of the particles that are in the air. There are also aircraft that can fly through those clouds and make a collection of samples, which can then be analyzed in a mass spectrometer, which is it's kind of like a laser that vaporizes anything that's in the collected sample and each of those particular elements will show up in a particular, it's, it's like a rainbow scan, and it'll produce spikes wherever there is a particular color that's produced by each of the unique elements that are in it. Yes, yes it would. Obviously we gotta stay strong in this, because this is gonna be a longer battle. What's your best guess of homespun trying to clean up this air for our, you know, in the car and also at home. What's your best guess at cleaning up this air so we stay a little healthier? Thanks. Short answer. There is no filter that we know of that's going to take out a particle that's one billionth of a meter in size. So you're stuck with breathing it.
the stuff shows up in the water. We have a rain sample right in front of me right here. No, you can't filter it out of water either. There's no way to get one billionth of a meter particle out of there. By the way, smoke, cigarette smoke is, is one millionth of a meter, and we're dealing with something that's a thousand times smaller than a particle of tobacco smoke. So in the process of being stuck, going back to it, you must create a daily awareness of detoxing that your body will remove it. Your body has been given, God-given abilities to remove these toxins. Magnesium as an element, two elements of magnesium will remove one aluminum. So you must, everybody is magnesium deficient. You must increase that. Other things as well. As your body discharges out the toxins, uh, particularly aluminum, heavy metals, mercury, etc., it's in your colon. The last uh, first two-thirds of your colon's job is to reabsorb what it is. The guy, uh, your body has this tremendous ability to recycle. You've got to block the recycling mechanisms on metals. Corella and other algaes will do that. So there's more on that. There is something else that we should be aware of, and that is that anytime you're spraying chemicals over populated areas, it starts to fall into the purview of Title 50 United States Code, which is the statutes regarding chemical and biological warfare. Now, there are sections in Chapter 32 of Title 50 where it talks about exceptions to this prohibition of spraying over populated areas. There has to be a presidential directive in writing. There has to be notice given to the Secretary of Health and Human Services. There has to be a written notice given to each governor in each state where the spraying is anticipated to occur. So this means that there is a paper trail. There must be. If you are familiar with OSHA, if any of you work in a blue collar job, you know about the Occupational Safety and Hazards Administration. Look up the material data safety sheet for aluminum oxide nanoparticles. It says very clearly on that sheet, should never be distributed into the environment without the proper government permits. There has to be a paper trail. There has to be a permit. If there has to be a permit, that means that someone has to be responsible. So if you can prove that this stuff is on your land, that it led to the failure of your crops, there has to be a paper trail for when and where this happened. There has to be some liability somewhere. So my guess is that we should all start sending out our Freedom of Information Act requests regarding the guidelines that are set forth in Title 50, Chapter 32, Section 1512. Look it up. You can find it on the net. Right on. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to do something like Mara said about the hyperspectral analysis. Has anybody done it yet? I think uh, Clifford Carnicom down in New Mexico has. That's how we originally determined what the materials were in the chemtrails, the aluminum, strontium, and barium. That's where the original the, determination So came it from. has been done. Like, so instead of reinventing the wheel, we actually have this evidence. What funds, Kathy? That's what I would ask. We're trying. I spoke in front of the California Energy Commission in 2010 at that meeting. The Energy Commission authorized and funded a $250,000 spectrometer for that exact purpose. Any device of that caliber that the state will recognize is not cheap. I don't have $250,000, and this is where people must understand the degree to which information is being covered up. I served information at that meeting to the state's top scientists. It's the last we ever heard of any of this. That meter is who knows where. If we simply break the dam of silence on this issue, so many wheels will turn. So many will turn. Let's get it on the national yes. news. Yes. Expose yes. it a la yes. Geraldo Rivera style. Say, here we go. We're on national news. It's yes. a vent. That will put us on the radar. I wholeheartedly agree with that. Thank you. It's going to take the pressure of the people. And if you look at each other, you're the people here. And it's going to take your pressure. And your pressure from this movement will create more pressure and more pressure until somebody starts listening. And when that starts to happen, then that's when this will turn around, okay? I'm a college student, and I go to Shasta College here. And um, I think you need to get a group of college students going to every university. That needs to be a mission. I would be a part of that. I would lead that. There's other activists here I hope you connect with before you leave. If we can build that list and build that list of contacts in colleges, as you suggest, I will, Geoengineering Watch will do its best 
to supply as many flyers as we possibly can for free to those groups. If, we, if I can just have the help in locating contacts in those locations, we'll supply them as much as we possibly can. The real question that I have is, there's been samples pulled from the air and the water, but has there been any sa samples pulled from the airline filtration systems from high altitude airlines? As far as collecting samples from aircraft uh, of the chemtrails and uh, trails that are being left by other aircraft, yes, there is a company, I believe it's called Atmospheric Analytics Incorporated. They have uh, what amount to Learjets that have these little devices on the side that will suck in the air sample and collect it. So yes, there is a way to do it. It's not cheap, but it can be done. Dr. Davis, you've spoken before about finding um, hair analysis and in children, in infants. I'd like to hear more about that. Is that in the Bible, we're taken from dust and we're gonna go back to dust. The dust is the 103 elements of the universe. We need 64 of them in the right ratio that allows our genetic expression to be all it can be. What I find on a regular basis, the average American is deficient on all lines in this mineral war. However, the toxic elements are extremely active and they will take on and they'll sit on a receptor site where the normal nutrient metal should be. So as an example, aluminum will sit where magnesium should sit on the receptor site in the behavior of a cell. So the drama is, going back to a question about air filters, this is nanoparticles. This is beyond what your eye can see by 30,000 fold. This is something you cannot filter out. And yet when you breathe it, it goes straight into your nostrils. You have no defense against it. It will end up in your brain. And then as you breathe, it'll also go into your lungs. There's no defense to get that. However, you do have a God-given ability to get that out. So, in the, so at the final day, what you have is, is there a way to test if I am poisoned? And the answer is yes. The drama is your body will not allow it to stay in the bloodstream. So doing a blood test is useless. Doing a urine test is useless because your body's desperately trying to get rid of it. It'll get rid of it through. It may stay, store in your kidneys and in your liver. Anybody want to do a kidney biopsy? No. So the most efficient, inexpensive way to do things are with clinicians who would do DMPS and DMSA challenges, which will force the cells to let it go. However, those particular procedures sometimes are toxic and you have some difficulty with that because you're freely letting go for the first time a toxic load. For me and my house and my clinicians I work with, we use a simple hair analysis because it's an excretory canal to get rid of poisons because your skin is your third kidney. You get rid of the poisons through your liver, through your colon, through your kidneys, through your skin. And your hair just happens to be living in your skin. So whatever is in your bloodstream will show up in your hair. So the point is, question, taking baby's hair and then shaving it, sending it off to a CSI lab, and get an analysis back, in a perfect world, you should have no aluminum, inorganic aluminum in your body. And when that mark comes back high, when cadmium comes back high, when strontium comes back high, and barium comes back high on babies, we have a toxic problem. Thank you. Yes, my question is for Mr. McCandless. I recently read a paper you wrote describing how um, the nanoparticulates were used in the jet fuel uh, to create a stabilization um, in the fuel at high altitudes. I found that very interesting. The particular um, practice of putting nanoparticles or uh, nanometal particles in jet fuel, there was actually a NASA study that was done, released in May of 2001. Um, yes, there we go, right there. It's um, entitled Nanotechnology and Gelled Cryogenic Fuels. Now, the study goes into a lot of different areas, everything from rocket propulsion to regular turbo jet engines, the kind you see on airliners, including uh, the proposal to <coughs> include uh, Jet Fuel A and JP-8, which are fuels that you find in jet airliners and military aircraft. The idea is that if you have oxide-coated aluminum, that is two atoms of aluminum and three atoms of oxygen. When it's consumed in the combustion reaction, it releases all that oxygen and it produces a much more efficient combustion. Of course, the aluminum metal comes out the exhaust pipe afterwards and it winds up being in part of the trail. The trick is that you're essentially 
containing an oxygen supply in the fuel itself, which means you can go to much higher altitudes where there's not that much oxygen. Right. It gives you an advantage militarily. It gives you an advantage as a commercial carrier because you can go much further on less fuel. The problem is eventually it comes down as fallout that we breathe. First of all, I want you to bring up, I'd like to bring the, would be the correlation between HARP and the enhancement that HARP does to the geoengineering. Most people have heard of the HARP facility. It's an ionosphere heater. The acronym is High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program. But there are at least, we believe, two and a half dozen of these large ground-based facilities around the globe, an unknown number of smaller RF transmitters. They appear everywhere on the radar. And, and this, the, the radio frequencies are a huge part of the climate modification. So we're all walking in tennis at this point, literally. We're more conductive. The atmosphere over the continental U.S. has been measured at 400 percent. It's historic conductivity. All this enhances the RF frequencies. And again, in the case of HARP, we're talking about 3.5 billion watts, billion with a B. There are no studies on much of the long-term effects, but these, as Mark explained very well, this is part of how they move the air masses around. Mark explained that extremely well. So these are completely connected aspects of climate engineering. You can't separate the two. So there's a lot of aspects to it other than the trails that we see so visibly. None of them benevolent and none of them in our best interest. And a biological effect to this, just so that you'll know, is that the more aluminum is in your body, the more sensitive you are to these fields. And what happens is we're seeing more and more people being energetically sensitive so that they can't even walk through a mall and other places or hold cell phones and whatnot because they themselves have become... I remember when I came to Reading in 85, we only had a couple of TV stations. We put aluminum foil on the uh, antennas. <laughs> You're now the new aluminum foil. I live in Reno, Nevada, and uh, you had uh, on your website an interview with the guy that was a director at the uh, uh, Desert Research Institute. The day after that that interview happened, the sky was waffled even more than normal. And it, well, the bottom line was he said that silver dioxide is not harmful to the body. And that's the only thing they use in, in cloud seeding. And the thing that I've noticed after living in Reno for four years is that the more they seed, the less it rains, and wanted to know what that, why that is. When you put these particles into the air, because they're so small, moisture and ice crystals have a tendency to naturally gravitate towards these particles. If you heat the particles up, you can then carry the moisture to a higher altitude where the jet stream will carry it further downstream like a conveyor. So you can prevent the rain from falling where it would normally fall. That's one of the reasons. And because they're preventing the rain from falling right here in California, anywhere on the east of the Mississippi when it's got to rise again, they're getting rained on like hell.